Good evening. Welcome to Levy. I am full. <laughs> what a wonderful meal we had tonight. That doesn't give the preacher much air to preach on, though, after eating that much. And I'm afraid all you may go to sleep. So you only get a piece of king cake if you stay awake during the sermon tonight. So <laughs> it is good to welcome you tonight as we gather for worship. It is always good to gather with God's people in God's house. Psalm 119.55 says, I've remembered thy name, O Lord, in the night. And so we do. <clears throat> All day long I've been with Jesus. It has been a glorious day. I just moved up one step higher, and I'm walking on the King's highway. He is Lord, He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. I always forget that part. And I, as long as we stop, I have to tell y'all, you're making the whole room list. Have y'all noticed that? I don't know what the deal is. Everybody shifted to this side. All right, let's do the best, rest of He is Lord. You got the chimes. I'll get this by, by December. Okay, here we go. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead and He is Lord. Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and adore you. We're so grateful to be your children and to be able to pray for those who are whom our heart yearns. Father, we lift to you tonight those who mean so much to us, who are facing a myriad of different difficulties, uh, some with grief and some with health issues. Father, we know you're the great physician, and we're not ashamed to ask you for healing. And Father, we're at your will that you would do so. And Father, certainly the healing of the Spirit in times of tribulation or grief or sadness, that you are the one who is the peace of our soul, the one who gives to us that which passes understanding. Father, we lift those names to you tonight who are hospitalized, uh, Vera Lyles, Rick Hyde, Melba Fuller. We remember those who are facing end-of-life issues, Ms. Joanne Lacey and her family, palliative care, Mr. James Allen Proctor, and others who are on our hearts tonight. Father, we thank you that to you every name is known personally. We ask as your people to move in these lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, 
send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains dear dying lamb thy precious blood shed never lose its power Till all the ransomed church of God are saved to sin no more, are saved to sin no more, are saved to sin no more, till all the ransomed church of God are saved to sin no more. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. To cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter than 
whiter than snow. There's power in the blood. Yes, power in the blood. Ten times are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood. Yes, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. Oh, there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, there's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. What power that song is. Please join me in offertory prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you tonight as a family of your followers, and we thank you for the wonderful day that you provided to us to be in your house all day. There's been many activities in this church today, and we hope that they all please you and that you. Um, um, we just thank you for the opportunity to be here and be able to do those activities. We come to you tonight and we pray over this offering that we're about to take up. Pray that these monies will be used for your will and your way, whether it be here locally or or if you see other areas that need need them, then that's okay as well. We pray for Brother Stephen tonight. Pray that a message uh, will come from him into us and pray that that message will just lighten our hearts and um, just love you more and more and allow that love to spill out into the world and, and to other people. And we just pray for those that are unable to be here. Uh, we know that you're the ultimate healer and counselor, and you will do what needs to be done to, to make sure that they're back in this house. And if there's anybody here tonight that doesn't know you, may tonight be the, the night that they can make the best decision of their life and, and come forward at a later time. So, And again, we just thank you for everything you provided for us. Forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name, amen.
and in all things give him thanks and in all things let your gratitude shine through and in all things give him thanks for he has given all things unto you give thanks to god for he is good his love endures forever give praise to him the lord of lords his love endures forever he spread the earth and sky and sea he filled them all with light and life may god alone be lifted high his love endures forever. Give thanks to God, for He is good. His love endures forever. We join the song that never ends. His love endures forever. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. His love endures forever. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in this grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the clean, cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your nose be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bright? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. Thank you, Brother Jim. Wonderful hymns tonight. Now, as always in Scripture, there is around every corner 
a surprise, the unexpected. And in the midst of the letters we've been studying in the book of Revelation, we find this in the middle letter, the fourth, the letter to the church at Thyatira. It's found in Revelation chapter 2. We find that our Lord spoke the longest word to the smallest church. Uh, to me, that is by far and away the most definite, definitive, specific, inclusive letter out of these seven. And it's spoken to a church that was in an inconsequential city, uh, the least distinguished. Uh, Pliny the Elder, who was a geographer, uh, just kind of lumped them all together contemptuously. And he wrote, there are a number of other cities like Thyatira and others of insignificance. <laughs> it was a small place and it was a small church. And yet we learn from this that Jesus' viewpoint of the church is not ours. His standard is different than ours. His criterion of measurement is not as ours. As our Lord discerns and weighs and proves His church, He doesn't measure the way that we measure. He doesn't weigh the way that we weigh. He doesn't calculate the way that we calculate. He had the most to say to the church that was undoubtedly the smallest among the seven. We would do well to remember that in our weighing and our measures when it comes to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We find the Lord Jesus identifies himself to the church at Thyatira in a way that he doesn't to any of the other churches. We've noticed that in each of these churches, the Lord Jesus identifies himself from a part of the description of him that is given by John in chapter 1. But it is only to the church at Thyatira that he distinguishes himself, he identifies himself by that august and supreme title, the Son of God. There's some symmetry and balance here. Out of seven letters, this is the middle letter. There are three leading up to it. There are three descending down from it. It's a word of authority and power. To the smallest church comes speaking the Son of God. And then he uses two striking figures to describe himself. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has his eyes like to a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. The Lord Jesus calls attention to his omniscience and to his strength. There's a word here about his vision, and there's word about his provision for judgment. His vision, he calls attention to his eyes. He says he has eyes like a flame of fire. When we saw John's encounter of the Lord Jesus in the first chapter, he looked upon the face of Jesus and he described them like streams of fire coming out from the eyes of Jesus. That which would cut through every facade, that which would melt every veneer uh, in every church or every soul that is put in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees them with an x-ray vision. And then he described his feet in verse 18, like in chapter 1, saying that they are likened to fine brass. The suggestion there is about judgment, brass that has been burned in the furnace. The idea is that this Son of God, walking in judgment, everywhere he steps, there would be a blaze of fire, his eyes able to see to the verities of every soul. It's so striking. When you contrast the first coming of Jesus with the second coming of Jesus. When Jesus came the first time, he was the son of man. He was the carpenter of Nazareth. His feet fell upon the Sea of Galilee. And when the waves washed up on the beach, they washed away his footprints, just like they did those of every other man. But when he comes again, he interferes in the final unwinding of history. And he is described as one that every footfall has upon it feet that are like brazen fire that will pursue it until everything is judged. That's how he presents himself. He says, 
I'm omniscient in my vision. Nothing gets past my eyesight. He says, I am omnipotent in my judging power. No one gets past my rule of judgment. Now, sometimes we read this description of the Lord Jesus and we ask the question, is this what Jesus will look like when we get to heaven? If I were to leave earth tonight and to open my eyes in heaven, is this what I would see? And it's hard to say. Because John is using words to describe something that words can't fully describe. It's as if John had searched all of the dictionaries of all the world and used his very best to describe what was seen there. But I believe that much more is said here than what human language can ever really say. What we do know is that when a believer looks upon the Lord Jesus in eternity, it will be a face and a presence that will inspire peace and love and the joy of heaven. And for every unbeliever who faces him in judgment, it will be everything but that. As he speaks to the church at Thyatira, he says in verse 19, I know your works. And then after he says, I know your works, he unfolds fourfold what those works consist of. He says, and your charity, which is the King James word for love, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience, your works. And the last shall be more than the first. I know thy works. Jesus said some commending things about this church. In the first place, he said, you have some invisible motivators like love and faith. And then there were the visible demonstrations of your works. He says, you have patience, which means perseverance. He says you have acts of service. You see, our Lord could see things that others could not see. And he saw two pairs of virtues. The one is visible. The one is invisible. And he begins with, first of all, your fellowship is characterized by your love. You know, I don't know anything better that the Lord Jesus could say about a church than that it is a church of love, that the people love one another. And the people love the pastor, and the pastor loves the people. It was the first on our Lord's list. He said, I notice your love, that which is invisible. But then love gets paired with something that is visible. Your service to one another. That is, invisible love becomes concrete in acts of service to one another. You remember he had told his disciples, all men that will know that you're my disciples, how? Because you love one another. He said, not primarily because you love the world, because, but because you love one another. That's what will characterize you as those who follow me. Those small gestures of love that don't get past the Lord's eyesight, that he takes note of. And this word for service, it's diaconate. It's the word we get the word deacon from. He's talking about those small gestures that love acted out in serving. And then he says faith. Now again, faith is invisible, but it is manifested by something visible. And that is what the King James uses, patience or the word perseverance. That is, when the Lord looks at your life, he says, I see the invisible. I can see your love and I can see your faith. But I also see the visible. I see your service, and I see your perseverance. And then he adds this wonderful compliment. He says, you're now doing more at the last than you did at the first. That is a compliment. What Jesus was saying is that the record of the church at Thyatira is that it was ascending and not descending. It had inclined and not declined. They, they were doing more and more instead of less and less. You know, I've had believers say to me sometimes, almost kind of solemnly, well, pastor, I've retired from active Christian service. You know, I did this in the church for this many years, and they'll spill it out to me, you know, and, and, and now I've retired from that. I, I don't do that anymore. But I look at their life and they haven't retired from anything else. They haven't retired from vacation. They haven't retired from their recreation 
or anything else that they are doing in life. It seems that they're giving more time and more investment to recreating themselves, all the while saying, I've retired from active Christian service. May I say to you, we may serve Jesus differently at 80 than we did at 18, but we still serve Jesus. And I don't find anything in the scriptures that talks about retiring from active Christian service. We serve him until the day that we meet him face to face. You know, what a testimony. There is nothing that blesses this pastor's heart more than when there are people in their 70s and their 80s about whom it could be said that the body of Christ is the apple of their eye. They love the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the center of their family, the center of their energy today is more than it ever was. More and more in love with Jesus and with the body of Christ. For Jesus to be able to say, more at the last than at the first, what a compliment. To be greater serving Him in the way He would have you to do now. Well, in the integrity of the Bible, After this commendation, uh, Jesus doesn't hesitate to say in verse 20, not with standing. That is, as energetic as your deeds are, as flaming as your love is, as enduring as your perseverance is, there was a single thing, not with standing. Now, it's always good to be positive. It's always good to be optimistic. But... Nevertheless, nonetheless, true biblical exposition is not always positive. To be true to the Scriptures means that we must also see that which Jesus condemns and not just that which He commends. Now what was said of this church is that while they were loving and serving and faithful and persevering, they were tolerating something that they should not be tolerating. They were tolerating a single member in the fellowship of the church. Verse 20, he says, I have a few things against you. Because you permit that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. It's one of the most interesting and most mysterious statements to be found in all of these seven letters to the churches. In a church where there was so much that was right, there was an individual in the life of this church who was kind of a malignancy on the heart of things. This church uh, should have condemned, but instead was tolerating. Now, who she is is very difficult to surmise. That. I would say this person's name is probably not Jezebel. I cannot imagine a Christian parent or a Jewish parent uh, in that day naming their little girl uh, Jezebel. You know, when I've uh, dedicated children to the Lord, I've dedicated a lot of Matthew, Marks, Lukes, and Johns, but never a Judas yet, you know. (laughs) And, And I kind of doubt that Jezebel was the actual name. It's probably more of a description of her character than it is her actual name. Well, what's her activity? He says she's misleading God's servants down a path doctrinally that was wrong. Now, she claimed to be a prophetess. She claimed to have knowledge of God's Word that others did not have. She was claiming this mysterious insight that God had given her something above and beyond what He had given to the others. She says, despite what Paul has told you, despite what John has told you, despite what Jesus taught, there's something that I have that is above that. I have an additional word. You know, it's amazing how often this kind of thing has happened in the history of the church. You could leave Levy tonight and drive uphill to John F. Kennedy Boulevard, and there you will see the Christian reading room of Christian science. Uh, inside that room, if you were to go inside, there's a Bible that is there. And beside the Bible would be a book. It's called Science and Health with a Key to the Scriptures. Uh, That book was written by Mary Baker Patterson Glover Eddy. If you read her biography, she is one of the most 
unusual women to have ever walked the face of the earth. But she claimed to have an additional word from God beyond the canon of the Scriptures. And there are people who were caught up, seduced by her false doctrine, and to this day still carry it on. Uh, if you've read about theosophy, one of the weirdest things that you can ever read about. It. Theosophers were led by a Russian woman, Helena Blavatsky. Uh, she had an addition, she said, to the Word of God. Well, there was someone like that in the church at Thyatira. And he says particularly two things about her, that, that she seduced his servants to commit fornication. He's talking about spiritual fornication. And to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, what was behind all of that, we can say with some probability. In the city of Thyatira, there were trade guilds. Uh, what we would think of today, uh, you know, is like a trade union. So if you operated commercially, you had to be a part of the guild. So there were plasterer guilds, there were statuary guilds, and for you to operate in business, you had to be a part of of one of those. You remember Lydia, the seller of purple. You see, everyone commercial belonged to a guild. Well, part of being in that guild was going every year to the main hall for a banquet. And at the banquet, they would pour out a liquid offering, a libation to the pagan god of that particular trade guild. And many times, that which started as a banquet evolved into you know, a gross and a carnal meal. Well, possibly this woman in the church with a mystic vision was telling those people of faith, that's okay. It's all right to worship and serve and love the Lord Jesus Christ in the church and then to serve a pagan God out in the world, to pour a libation and offering to a pagan God. You know, the question is as old as yesterday and it's as new as today. How do I live my Christian faith and at the same time be distant from the world in which I live. Well, in order to operate commercially in Thyatira, there weren't many options. You went to the guild hall or you pretty much starved. There was no other way to operate. And were they sacrificed to those pagan gods? She insisted it was okay to compromise. Now, this question about eating food that was sacrificed to idols, we talked about this last Sunday night. Uh, we don't think much of that today, but that was a live question in the early church. It was a huge matter of conflict between the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and the culture in which they lived. Tertullian of North Africa wrote a pamphlet on idolatry, and he talked about this very thing. And the people who worked in the field of idolatry, there were many of them who made their living by making uh, little statues to the pagan gods. Well, they would give their lives to Jesus Christ and they asked the question, how can I make a living if I don't keep doing what I've been doing? And Tertullian came back and his answer was, must you live? Now, what that underscores is that to follow Jesus Christ, you have to make some hard choices. It means sometimes putting the hand to the plow, not looking back. It means that uh, you may be called upon to do things. Jesus said you will be taken in before kings and magistrates. You will be cast into prison. Uh, it was a serious thing to follow Christ in this day. But I want you to notice the amazing grace of the Lord Jesus in this letter. He gives her and hers some more time to repent. In verse 21, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. That's such an amazing statement of grace. I mean, you would think that someone that the Lord Jesus termed Jezebel would be someone who was past forgiving. You would think this might be someone who's past that line of opportunity of grace that her time to repent is over. Jesus said, I'm still going to give her a little more time to repent. But if she does not, and if those who follow her do not, eventually judgment is going to come. Now, there's a couple of things to learn out of that. 
You know, one of those is that the opportunity to repent is a gift from God. While we have that opportunity, it's gift. Repentance is not a flower that grows in any soil. Uh, our wells are so paralyzed. We, we get so caught up in what our desires, our cravings, our obsessions are, that it's a grace of God that any of us would ever repent. But he does put a bracket of time around it. There's a space I've given her. There's a time I've given to her that she can repent. And if she does not, then judgment will come. It's a reminder to you and to me that people really don't go to hell because of murder. They don't go to hell because of adultery or theft or even heresy. At the end of the day, people go to hell because they do not seize the opportunity to repent. They say, no, until time is gone. Well, our Lord makes a promise to this church in verse 24 but to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden, but that which you have already, hold fast till I come. Now, I think this is such a sweet phrase from the Lord Jesus. Here was this mystic prophetess, and she's saying, I can teach you the deep thing what Helena Blavatsky called the secret doctrine. I can teach you the deep things that, that the Christians don't know about. And Jesus says, you know what? Hold fast to the things you learned in the beginning. <clears throat> <clears throat> that word for the depths of Satan is the word bathosphere. That is the bottom of the ocean. She was claiming, <clears throat> I can teach you things as deep as the bottom of the ocean. Jesus comes along and says, you want to be true? Hold fast to the things that you have. Church family, you know what the most important things are that you and I have ever learned since we have known Jesus? It's the very first things that we ever learned that are the most important. Precious. Having been with many people, if they have left this world and gone out into the presence of God, I can promise you that when you come to that moment that life here is almost over, when you come to that place where the silver cord is about to be loosed and the golden bowl is about to be broken, What's on your mind is not the latest deep doctrine of Dr. Pretzelmaker and his profundity. What's on your mind are the first things you ever learned. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. A person goes out of this world... Their mind is on the first things that they ever learned. Jesus speaks such a sweet word. He says, go back to the first things you learned. You know, a person can go out and out and out in theology until the rudiments and the principles of the first things of the Christian faith don't even ever cross their minds anymore. Things like the fact that God was incarnate. He came as a little baby. That He bled to death on a cross for our sins. That He literally came out of that tomb. That He ascended back to heaven bodily. And that one day He's going to come again in like manner. Those are the things that Jesus said, let them nurture and nourish your soul. Hold fast to those things till I come, he says. Well, so we should. Now Jesus quotes from the book of Psalms. He quotes 
from Psalm chapter 2, that psalm we looked at just a few weeks ago on Sunday morning, where Jesus comes in judgment. And he quotes Psalm chapter 2 and verse 9 in verse 27. He says that he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father. You know, this is a tiny little church in an inconspicuous little town. And he says, here's your destiny. At the end of time when I come to shatter things, when I come to judge things, when I come to bring an end to all things, I've got a promise to you. Look what he promised him in verse 26. He that overcomes and keeps my works to the end, to him will I give power over the nations. What, what do you think that little church thought? Jesus said, you will share in my vindication. You will share in my authority. I think they felt something like the 12 disciples felt. You remember when the 12 disciples were talking to Jesus and he told them, you 12 will sit upon thrones and you will judge the nations? What must they have felt? I mean, Peter, who had spent his life casting out a net on the Sea of Galilee to catch fish. Matthew, that penny pension tax collector, to be told you're going to sit on a throne and judge the nations? It's that kind of a promise that is given to the church at Thyatira. The first to hear this are those bowed down by Roman persecution. And he says, if you remain faithful, this is what will happen. But don't be seduced. Don't deflect because of a Jezebel. Hold fast to what you have. Don't let it go. Hold fast. And then, just a basic statement, his promise, verse 28, and I will give him the morning star. If you're faithful and your works are there of love and faith and deeds of service and patience, I'll give you the morning star. What did he mean? Well, clearly, when he talked about the morning star, just when, like when you and I talk about the morning star, he may have been talking about one of the planets, usually Venus or some other planet, bigger and brighter than anything else out there. When do you see it? In the dawn, uh, just after the darkness, and you know, an hour before, after a whole night of darkness. And now the morning star appears, a, a, a night of tossing and turning and despair. You go and open a window when it's darkest, just before the brightest, and the morning star before dawn. But I wonder, too, if the Lord Jesus doesn't have something much deeper here. As you read on in the book of Revelation and you come to the last few pages, you'll find that Jesus calls himself the morning star. It's a title that he took upon himself. And I wonder, does he not say, if you're faithful, it is I. It is I. The Word of God tells us that there will be a time of restoration. The book of 2 Peter says that the heavens and the earth are going to be burned with a fervent heat. The heavens will disappear. The stars will scatter as the night. The sun is going to be darkened. The moon is going to turn to blood. When all of that darkness has come, where is the light? No, oh, who is the light? The morning star of all eternity. And I believe Jesus may just be saying, when everything else has gone dark, I'll be the light that you see. Let us bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus who shines light into the heart and the soul of everyone who trusts and believes in Him. Father, make us a people of whom Jesus could say, I've noticed your love and your faith. I've noticed your service and your perseverance. Father, let us not get seduced by the world to think 
that the things of this world are more important than the things of the next world. Father, we don't know how long you'll have us walk this earthly sojourn. Father, you call us all home at different ages. But Father, however long it is, let us be men and women who love you right up to the moment that we open our eyes in glory. Father, make us people of whom you could say about us that they served me more at the last than they did at the first. Father, help our love for you to grow, our service for you to grow, for us to not retire or give up or lay down, but to keep fighting the good fight and to hold fast to the things that we learned at the first, to not grow weary of them or embarrassed of them or tired of them, but to say, these are the things that gave me life. This is why I'm born again, and I'll hold fast to them until I'm in His very presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross in the soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross a trembling soul, love and mercy found me. There the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me in the cross. In the Beyond the river. When I became your pastor 19 years ago, uh, I began my pastorate with you by preaching through the seven churches in the book of Revelation. We began this study. And we had in our church at that time Miss Nancy Jordan. Many of you remember Miss Nancy. And she and her husband had been missionaries in South America. And her husband was homebound. He was unable to be in church anymore. He was very sickly. And I went by to visit with him and, and meet him uh, as his new pastor. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, you know, I've been reading where you're, you're preaching through the seven churches in Revelation. And, and I said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, you know, I was just thinking, isn't that amazing? Those churches, 2,000 years ago, they were literal local churches. And Jesus spoke a letter to them. And 2,000 years later, we're reading those letters, and you're, we're still learning from them 2,000 years later. And at first when he said that, I, I think I just thought, well, that's kind of a simple thought because that's true of all Scripture. All Scripture is ancient, and it's still speaking to us today. But I've thought about that a lot over the years. So, you know, the church at Thyatira and the church at Pergamos and at Smyrna and at Ephesus, 
They've come and gone. And it's true in our own lifetime. Uh, there was a time here in North Little Rock that we had a First Baptist Church that, that's not here anymore. And there was a Pike Avenue Baptist Church that's, that's not here anymore. And there's a Grace Baptist Church that's not here anymore. When I began pastoring Southern Baptist churches in Arkansas, we had a little over 1,400 churches in our state. Today we have a little over 1,500 churches. There's been a lot of churches that passed away and a lot of churches that were born. But we're always planting new churches. But all through the course of 2,000 years, God's people come to serve Him, love Him, and they pass out into eternity. And these come to love Him and serve Him, and they pass out into eternity. They come to love Him and serve Him. And, pass. and His Word still remains true. We stand, in a sense, on the shoulders of those who've come before us. And there will be those after us who will stand upon our shoulders in this place or in another place. It's a big kingdom out there, you know. And it's all about the kingdom, not just the local church. But we will spend eternity together in the place called heaven, worship Him and praise Him. And what a glorious word that is. Moses. We get to have a conversation with him about when he saw that alabaster bush that wouldn't burn and God spoke to him, I am. And we get to talk to Paul about his missionary journeys and to John and what it was like to walk with Jesus on the shores of Galilee and in Jerusalem. But also the people we know and love just in the last few years. A parent, a grandparent, an aunt or an uncle. We are the people of eternity as people of the book. And that should keep us encouraged. This is not all there is. Whatever we face in this life, we're just pilgrims passing through. Our treasure is laid up beyond the blue. Let's not let our eyes ever become too focused down here or so focused down here that we forget that that is eternity. And that's where we're headed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank You for loving us so much. Thank You for Jesus. And thank You that You would send Him into the world so long ago, and yet it's new and fresh to everyone who places trust and faith into Him right now and is born again. Father, help us to hold fast to those things that we first learned that brought our new birth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to have king cake in the fellowship hall. Keep in mind, every cake has a little plastic baby in it. Don't want anybody to get choked. So watch out for the little baby. Okay. God bless you. <laughs>